Welcome to the Modern Mythos Podcast, a show dedicated to the keepers and players of the Call of Cthulhu role-playing game and other investigative horror games. I'm Seth Skorkowski. And I'm John Hook, and together we discuss writing, game mastering, and player tips, and how you can apply them to your table. In this episode, we continue working on the scenario that we're building and writing together. And last time we did a poll. I guess it was two episodes ago. We let that poll yes. sit there for a while. A couple months ago, episode 16, we initiated the poll. It was uh, on our Patreon page, so it was just for our patrons to uh, to weigh in, and uh, it was close. It was very close, but the results are in, and the the patrons, the beautiful, amazing, perfect patrons have chosen my idea. So we will be developing my idea. <laughs> I was I, I was I was gonna give you like Vincent Price and Peter Lore and Christopher Lee. <laughs> it was gonna be amazing and now I'm not. Damn. Well we'll just <laughs> shelve that for the future. No, it's dead forever. <laughs> dead forever <laughs> You don't want it now. You never get it. Okay, so we're going to fry that for my cold, dead hand. 1970s film set in the Philippines. And just because it has been a while, what is what was the the actual pitch that uh, that was voted on? Like, what, what you know, because we, we're not going to be able to change anything that was voted on. The people spoke. But, um, People have spoken exactly, yeah. So uh, for those who just to jog memories, in episode sixteen we utilized those uh, amazing Call of Cthulhu Keeper decks, and we were just kind of pulling cards from all the categories, and we're going to leverage those cards to create this scenario. Three of the cards that we pulled were NPCs, you know, some characters, and. We came up with a, uh, a character, a, a 19-year-old uh, female, Chloe Kirshner. Kirscher. 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 Uh, I'm in no place was, to ever make fun of a last name, but right? <laughs> she's not real. I'll make fun of hers. It, there you go. <laughs> there you go. You know, where are the simple names? Like Hook, right? You know, simple. Uh, but her card says that she was a movie star, and... I thought that was kind of cool because then we pulled another character card, Bartholomew Crane the third, the third, who was listed as a stage actor. I thought, oh my god, we've got two, you know, like film stage, you know, and they could be inter- you know, people who are, are trained on the stage transition to film all the time, you oh. know. So you've got these two entertainers like that. So, so it's weird. Is like. As you're talking, I'm looking at them because we wrote down uh-huh. our stats. And uh, have you have you really paid attention to Bartholomew Crane the third stats? His strength is thirty. <laughs> His size is thirty five. It's like he's a very uh, he's ta- tattooed for enough. Fantasy Island. <laughs> well, so he doesn't necessarily have to be short. He could be he could be uh, just comp- very very thin. Right, oh. he could just be this like, like stick man, you know, almost. Oh, uh, he's, thinking, uh, he's the one that always put the monster suits because they can like. Right. Oh, okay. Right, 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 right. Yeah, um, we're we're oh, gonna be changing that, these. Uh, <laughs> you know, change, update the stats. Yeah, we may be updating. So, look at the app though. He's he's got an eighty appearance. I mean, so this guy oh, was. He's a pretty scarecrow. <laughs> you know, he was definitely built to be uh, seen, you know, with a with an eighty app. But you're right; he is. I think he's just you know thin as a stick, well, and uh, it's perfect to to have costuming and makeup and stuff packed on. Chloe is a twenty five strength, um, size thirty. I mean, this movie was Lord of the Rings. Are these hobbits? Uh, <laughs> app ninety. So. Super duper pretty. Yeah, she's a knockout. Her sand started at 35. Wow. Um, <laughs> Frail physically and mentally. Yeah, wow. 
Um, I never, I actually, I'd only paid attention to like their names and like the little pictures and what their titles were. Right. But I was talking about, like, I, I had pictured Bartholomew Crane the third as kind of like, you know, suave, you know, yeah, a little keep athletic. Keep that picture. And, yeah, keep that, well, keep that picture, but now shave 30 pounds off of him. Oh, like, uh, like, like when Christian Bale did that thing where he like got his weight down to like a hundred pounds or something for some role. Right. That, that's what it is. He's like, and, yep. then, and then in the next movie, he's going to be like, you know, twice that size, like a week later, because he does the bail method where he just packs on a bunch of muscle and loses it. Exactly. Days. Okay. And our, our, our third, our third NPC is Nigel Hedenhammer, a parapsychologist. And so from the NPCs themselves, that is what kind of, kind of, fueled my idea for the the general plot of this scenario which is chloe our movie star is missing and that will be the the initial impetus for the players to get involved is we have to find chloe now we're not really sure what has happened because she's missing but she went missing and i and I, you know, I like the idea of it being a 1970s kind of uh, grindhouse exploitation kind of movie thing. And then that kind of, you know, having that just as a vague idea is what spurred us to think about the Philippines and how actual films, you know, actual 1970s you know, exploitation movies were filmed in the Philippines at that time. So, and it's a cool setting because it's, it's, you know, it's remote and it's You've got that tropical and exotic it's tropical. It's, it's very exotic and, and there's just so much that we can do, you know, and I love the seventies as a, as a time period for this because there's technology, but honestly, Technology in the 70s isn't that far different than, for Call of Cthulhu's sake, that far different than what we would see in the 1920s and 30s. And by the fact that we set it in the Philippines where those areas, those remote areas, may not have been as developed as you would think maybe New York, Chicago, L.A. in the 70s, you know? Or even even when you when you are looking at the developed cities, yeah, you know, those major cities. Oh yeah, they've got they've got all the the modern technology and comfort. But we're not filming there. No, uh, you know, we're we on the are, boonies. We're on the boonies, which is pretty dang primitive, uh, and and pretty dang primitive pretty fast once you leave those uh, those high population cities. So, and that also gives a really cool dynamic of modern urban in the remote jungle right within yeah. no time at all yep so the the idea that i had which is what was voted upon is so chloe is missing that's one of our three uh, npcs from the cards and then the other two npcs i i actually had this idea where the keeper can run them as a as a foil as a competitive foil to the players and their characters because Chloe's family wants her back but Chloe's family because it's they're from California it's the 1970s and you know the the parents were you know flower children and everything they're very much in tune with trying to you know the the secret to finding Chloe is to track her aura trail and so they've hired the parapsychologist Nigel Hedenhammer and the parapsychologist is using, you know, as a, as almost like a guide and a partner and a, and a, a psychic anchor and connection is uh, Chloe's co-star in the film that they just finished called raining blood, uh, Bartholomew crane. So we've got Nigel and Bartholomew as this pair of really kind of incompetent and bumbling investigators but the problem is they might end out spoiling 
the trail. I had this idea where the keeper can kind of use them. And if our player character investigators are not being aggressive enough in trying to follow up on clues and do research and, you know, try and find the next step that will bring them closer to Chloe, then the keeper can, can spoil certain locations and certain clues that were at those locations because, you know, Nigel and Bartholomew had already, you know, bulldozed their way through it. So that'll be kind of something, you know, I think that might be an interesting mechanic for the uh, keeper to kind of drive, you know, having these bumbling uh, uh, investigators opposing the uh, the actual team and the actual team of investigators they've actually been hired by the by the studio the film studio lawyers and stuff because they may be looking at a possible lawsuit if they can't you know get all of their their hired people back home right so they're trying to stave off a you know a possible a perceived a lawsuit from Chloe's family. So they're like, we're hiring you guys. We're sending you to Philippines, find this woman, get her back alive. You know, we want to avoid any kind of, you know, legal problems. Well, uh, so and we'll get to this in a bit. I, I just recently did a, uh, I was just watched this documentary on, um, on this subject, which I'd already known a little bit about, but I had a wonderful, very big recent refresher on, on the movie industry in the Philippines at the time. And, it, it might be a case where the studio, because a lot of these guys were really unscrupulous, uh, like the the you know, kind of the, the Roger Corman uh, era, they might be kind of trying to hide this, but it could be uh, an insurance company or the talent agency that uh, that are doing it, and you could even have the studio is even trying to like. What are you talking about? Chloe went home. We didn't, right, we didn't have any yeah. problems. Chloe's Nothing. agent. Yeah. Nothing went wrong here, folks. So, um, <laughs> which could add another layer to it. If the, uh, the, the producers are not willing to help if they're trying to downplay that she's missing. Yeah. Maybe like, Oh, I heard you. I heard she, you know, I you know, went to, to Luzon and met a boy and, they got married and moved off to Australia. You know, like you know, you know these actresses, and kind of acting like nothing's wrong. So that's just an idea. I like that because I think we. I was originally. I have to go back and listen to sixteen, but I think it was originally the thought of the agent is uh, hiring the investigators, and that way the studio can be a can be an entity that. It's just and studio employees, they those they could be sus, you know suspects that the uh, investigators can be uh, investigating. So if if we're going to have the, uh, the the bumbling NPCs acting as a foil, we'll probably have to have a uh, suggested timeline of events. Like mm-hmm. on the first date, they do this. On the second date, they do this, and you know, kind of like ruin this, the, the site, like they destroy evidence or they take evidence away. And if the PCs visited after that, it's like, you know, th- they might have accidentally left something that would cause the, the, the player characters to then go the wrong direction and like waste a day before they figured out like, oh, that's what happened. And then they go back and but then now they've lost another day. Oh, what have these guys done in the meantime? Or you could have it where you know, they've paid some locals to like watch these spots. Like, see if anyone's acting suspicious. And the locals come back. It's like, well, there's this group of, you know, player characters that are asking questions. And now, you know, the the the, the actor and the psychic are like, those are the culprits. And you know, like they stage some sort of, you know, try to like arrest them or something, or they just end up finding the bad guy and getting sacrificed or something. Are we going to do a time limit? You know, I think a time limit would be good. I, I think this could be a good 
mainly because I kind of think of them, you know, think of scenarios for this purpose. This could be a good convention scenario. This, if we, if we design this right, this could be a really good four hour game that has a clock because of the bumbling, you know, com- competition uh, of the other NPC team. And, and there's other things too, because for the PCs, and this is something that we'll need to come up with through our design on locations, on what is a state of a location and its clues if the PCs get there first or if the PCs get there after the site has been spoiled by the opposing team. Because it's highly possible that some clues might become better after the spoiling. Maybe Nigel and Bartholomew drop something that they had collected, and now what they you know were maybe too close to to realize you know the NP, you know, the PCs, our investigators might have the better perspective to put those two pieces together and go, God, they didn't even realize that they had this, you know, and so okay, it would be so an like interesting. If you, if you go to it unspoiled. There's like two clues. One of them might send you off in the wrong direction. One of them will send you in the right direction. They showed up and they picked up the wrong one had left. And when the PC showed up, it's like, oh, there's one clue here. Oh, it sends us off in the right direction. Yeah. That, okay, that's a cool one because that now means like sometimes it's best to go after them. Exactly. And we, you know, it'll just be something for the players to discover. Well, it could also be aspects like uh, if we're going out to a remote site, like a filming location. And it's like, okay. There is one boat that can get you there. You have to go up this river or, uh, you know, something like that. And if the PCs get there first, they get to take the boat and everything's cool. But if Nigel gets there first, the, well, they went and then they came across a problem and that boat's now sunk. And now we're going to have to do one other step just to get there. Like maybe we'll have to pay more money or, you know, now we're riding in canoes uh, or, or something weird uh, that slows it down or costs them something in order to get to this location because the, just the way to get there has been spoiled. And the site's fine. It's just getting to it is not different. And that can kind of mix it up of like, you know, damn you, Nigel. <laughs> We had, to, we had to ride burrows to get to this site because you took the last Jeep that could get there. So that, that could be a fun little thing. And then we get there, they find out they actually like drove the Jeep off the road. And it was like, <laughs> took it out of the, 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 the whole picture. Okay. It actually makes me wonder when, uh, you know those those amphibious vehicles, the ducks? I wonder if they're, they might be kind of neat to have a, uh, a duck in this that uh, they might be able to use. That just that stray thought just came to me. Okay. No, no. Uh, I, I, I would love the idea of putting in just weird uh, vehicles. Yeah. So, so that is the that was the core idea that was voted for is that Chloe is missing and these other two NPCs are going to be bumbling foils, and uh, so that's what we're going to kind of try and build upon. We have other things that we pulled, you know, other cards that we pulled that included, you know, a list of unfortunate events, a list of monsters, a list of weapons and phobias. And I think it'll be pretty easy for us to uh, fold all those different things into this. I think it'll be pretty entertaining. So what I was thinking in today's episode as we try and workshop this is we can start kind of putting together some additional NPCs that we need to design for this. So, like, one would be the um, Chloe's agent that Hmm. hires them, you know? And uh, Uh, do you want me to uh, talk about the history of the Filipino (laughs) film industry. Yes. Yeah. Let's, because I think knowing this would be, it's changing the directions. I want to take it at a, at a couple of ways. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I've always loved terrible film and, uh, a lot of which were a lot of the old Roger Corman B movies. And 
because of that, a few years ago, I ended up watching a documentary called Machete Maidens Unleashed. And after John and I talked, and he informed me that I did not win the poll, I then, <laughs> once I finished crying, I then went out and I found an, a copy of Machete Maidens Unleashed, and I watched it again, this time with a notepad of like, what can we use? So, at, starting in the late 60s, the, the, the Philippines was a fantastic site for basically low budget exploitation films to go film. And they, because they had this jungle environment, it's kind of exotic and it was cheap, 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 cheap to make uh, movies. So this huge industry came out of that really with like the blood Island movies. And so it, you know, it kind of starts off, talks about the history of the, of, of, of exploitation cinema and kind of goes on to, cause they always had, Usually massive gore, violence, sex, you know, just all the, all the fun things you want to drive in movie. And they would talk about what the conditions were. And that was the one where one of the actresses talked about their dressing room was a cave. And that cave also substituted as the, the men's latrine. Oh man. That's oh, God. awful. And but they also talked about it was like the the wild east like you know in the, the first few years like there were guns everywhere and they talked about like oh you know the cameraman you know had like you know a, a six shooter on his hip and just like one of the guys talked about there was a gunfight in a hotel lobby uh but then we had the marcos re- regime in about 72 do martial law and that's when it changed and we had curfews and after a certain hour you could be arrested if you were out and they talked about uh, uh, Sid Haig, and one of them mentioned how if you were in a bar or club when curfew hit, they just locked the door and you had to stay there all night drinking uh, because you you weren't allowed out anymore. So I, I thought, depending on when we set it in the seventies, that would make a very big dynamic of you know if we did something like the curfews, oh, there's a new threat uh, that that you could have. But it brought up things like uh, the the military would often help with a lot of these. If you had like soldiers, like the, the guards, whatever women in prison camp they were held at, um, who had helicopters, they were military helicopters. And mentioning like they'd show up late for filming because that morning they had gone off to like do a bombing run on rebels, and then they had to swap out all their ammunition for blanks so they could begin filming, and uh, just crazy stuff that I think would make a really cool backdrop to, to work into it of uh, the stuntmen really weren't stuntmen. They were just cheap. Uh, life was cheap. So they had, um, mm-hmm. you know, what, what I'm talking about, like they didn't have fire suits. So you just like literally lit the guy on fire and he ran around it when he got too hot to jump in water. Uh, they didn't use a sugar glass. So if you threw someone through a plate glass window, you were literally throwing them through a plate glass window. Um, and it was just, OSHA would not be pleased with what the (laughs) the conditions were there. And a lot of the actors and actresses also endured, you know, doing your own stunts because no one else will do them for you. And uh, a lot of weird injuries. So I think that could be interesting as well as uh, big paper mache costumes and just all the, the the low budget uh, effects that they would, they would deal with. So, I think that could be a lot of fun, especially if we do have cases where you do have your unscrupulous producer who sends their team out to the Philippines, some actresses and actors, and they're going to shoot two movies because that way they only have to pay for like, you know, one flight there and one flight back where we go, we film the movie. And once that wraps, they then get up and they move to another location to film another movie 20 miles away. And we, we, have it where Chloe was in the first movie and then that wrapped in the second movie. She doesn't appear. And the, the producer is like, you know, time is money and I've got a, I've got a million hopeful starlets that would love that position. I'm sending another one out there and we're not even going to think about Chloe anymore because we don't want to, we don't want to hold up the, 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 the movie for an actress uh, because 
they were usually getting a lot of hopeful starlets at the time. So uh, that way we've got a film that's actually being made at another location. And maybe Chloe had spent a little time there. But then we've got the old location where the things maybe started happening. So they could give us those two things. Uh, plus the hotel, maybe where they're like, they would go and when they would make it to the big cities, uh, you know, what happened there as a good site that we could check out. And I really like the idea of the dressing room cave, since we are pulling into Sagawa, who is, is under the earth and with the serpent people who are under the earth, you could just have it be, it started in this cave that was the dressing room. And yep, I love that idea. And then, of course, I started having to do a lot more research on the Philippines. So it, it has uh, the massive seismic activity. Uh, according to Wikipedia, or wherever I was reading, uh, up to five earthquakes a day are recorded in the Philippines, most of which you can't even feel. Uh, but since they're at the edge of the ring of fire, there is a lot of uh, seismic stuff. So you could have it be there was a light earthquake, maybe one of the days of filming. Maybe maybe it was great. Maybe the director loved it. Like, oh, this is the greatest ending because then an earthquake actually hit and we didn't have to just shake the camera uh, to simulate one. But when that happened, maybe the back of the cave fell open. And, and that's when something came out. Or maybe she saw a statue like carved deeper inside and you know, something happened. But you could still link it to an earthquake, which in itself is not weird. But I think to players who aren't used to having seismic activity, basically, you know, those of us that are not on the, on the West coast, Mm -hmm. you know, there is a like, Oh, did the earthquake mean something? No, it's just the Philippines, but it did cause the inciting moment that the cave was expanded or collapsed. And when they dug it out and then what they pulled, when, when they rescued Chloe, it wasn't Chloe anymore. So we could do that because we were talking about maybe doing um, uh, the serpent person disguise. Right. Yeah. So we can do that where it's like, well, this thing happened to Chloe, but we got her out. But I think she was just so shaken that she went back to the States and that's why she's missing. So just spitballing ideas since it's your adventure and I'm not trusted with ideas. <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank my my loyal patrons yet again. No, <laughs> so I I haven't gone and looked. Am I going to find that that you and your wife are patrons and you just went and you joined it so you could throw those two extra votes, like one to tie and one to go over? Is that what it was? That's right. Oh, that's right. That's right. <laughs> uh, now a couple other things I did research at the time the 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 U.S. dollar to uh, Filipino peso currency. It fluctuated quite a bit during the 70s, but kind of averaging it, it would be about seven pesos to the dollar because you could also add that little bit of flavor of using uh, the peso currency and showing that that difference. Because I always like that when when you do have games that are, are set you know, outside of the US or outside of you know, England and, and we're dealing with conversion rates. And we'll also have to figure out which island we want it on. There's 76 right. to choose from. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is awesome, you know? So that, that maybe it was on a, one of the more remote ones. Or it could be like one remote one was the old film location. Another remote one nearby was the other. And then we have the city. Like the airport and the, the hotel, the after the wrapping party was. Or... And wherever they are, there's going to have to be, whether we create it or it actually exists, a small town, right? Because this this town, you know, they're going to profit from having the film crew there. They profit by the fact that the, you know, one of the stipulations for filming there is they have to hire all these locals to uh, fill in for some of the smaller behind-the-camera jobs the the locals are hired for on camera extras and all of this is going to be coordinated by the town mayor and i looked up you know the title for that so uh, i'm not sure how i would pronounce that a uh, punong uh, baya baya bayan a punong bayan is uh 
I'm probably destroying that, but uh, that that's the I, name. I just of assumed a, anytime I try to pronounce a word I'm not familiar with, I'm 100 percent yeah, guaranteed. Me, yeah, me too. I'm gonna. I'm totally gonna do it wrong. But that's that's the name of a uh, of a Filipino uh, town mayor is a uh, is a, a Punang Bayan. Oh, and the, like, uh, the Philippines are also broken into regions of different uh-huh. uh, like uh, government regions and all that. And uh, the other thing that documentary went into was like how how corrupt it was because part of the budgets for the movies included bribes. Uh, uh-huh. So. I, I don't think that is outside the realm of reason whatsoever that, Hey, if you want to film here, you got to bribe the, the, the local government official. And then they've got it set up to where, you know, you've got to use so many of the extras and the, the film industry at the time, there was a ton of, of very talented locals that were learning filming and editing and lighting and, you know, sound and, and, and all those, because you could get a local teach them and then you don't have to fly cameramen back and forth. And a, a lot of uh, Filipino directors and, and producers started popping up. So you could have like, you know, a very competent crew. And this could be like the fifth, sixth, fifteenth 15th movie they've done for this studio. Mm-hmm. producer, Right. And you know, like, you you could have like the, the 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 kind of jaded, you know, chain smoking cameraman who's like, oh yeah, let me tell you all the stories, man. And well, we can also have language barrier uh, issues, right? Because uh, as a Filipino and uh, and Spanish is uh, very common, and mm-hmm. uh, the Philippines, due to the Second World War and and the the liberation of the Philippines. Up, up until that that time, it kind of went away during the, the, the Marcos reign, but uh, it was very pro-American. And I'm actually going to have to talk to a buddy of mine who grew up in the Philippines, um, who's told me just wild stories when he was growing up there in the 80s, but of about all the World War II stuff that's just still there, like, mm-hmm. like big concrete bunkers and stuff like that, that they used to go play on and like do you know, have their, have their little adventures out there, which a lot of them could be sets. I like the idea of, you know, since this is the seventies and we're 30 years after the second world war, like if you do have to do something like take a seaplane to one of those islands or a boat, it's this old veteran from the war. Like, you know, it is like this, you know, 60 year old world war two veteran. And just like when the war ended, he stuck around and like some, some like, quirky fun little pilot guy or boat captain or, or you know runs the local tavern in the in the town we could also make some uh, uh bunkers or anything like that as one of the locations you know like they've got a, a war movie they're doing as the second one because uh, they did a lot of world war ii movies sure and you know they've built a uh, a camp there and you know they've got all all their stuff so yeah i like that I like the idea. It just wasn't mine. <laughs> <laughs> so this is cool because uh, I've I've been coming up with a as you've been talking, I've been writing down a list of NPCs that I think we need to uh, flesh out and create because these will be individuals that the investigators can interface with and help kind of direct their investigation, kind of get them and go in places. So. I started with Chloe's agent. So this will be this will be the person who initiates, pulls the investigators together and and gets them on the case. The client. And then and then we won't see them again. So this is not an NPC that we need to have deeply fleshed out, maybe not even gameable stats, but we need to have a name and we need to, you know, somebody that they can interface with and talk to. And get them out of the uh, out of California and get them to the Philippines. Once they're in the Philippines, though, there's going to be a whole host of of NPCs that they can interact with, and some of them will be foils. So, if we're doing a con scenario, and con scenarios are usually pretty like you know, go go go. Would we want to basically start it when they step off the plane and be all like? 
Uh, so this is what happened. And, you know, basically say like, you can, what questions did you ask the agent? But kind of yeah. assume we, this, yeah, the- this was a conversation we had, but literally start as, as you step off the plane, mm-hmm. the tropical sun. And like, Exactly. You're, you're here to find a star. Yeah. As a con scenario, the the wheels are touching down, and the 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 keeper will have this preamble and talk to them about you have just you know don't give them a choice. Say you have accepted this job, and when you know after you met with you know Mister So and So, who is Chloe's agent, and give them the backstory. And so you know wheels are down. You're in the Philippines, and this is why you're here. And now go. So yeah, we will cut out. There won't be a a role played scene with the agent, but it should be someone that we can name because, if need be, maybe they can place a phone call or something. Well, because there there is the uh, you could have the every day you have to call him, and, mm-hmm. and and give an update, or if 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 nothing's going on, like you know that he could kind of give him a kick in the butt. Now, now another idea is what if they step off the plane and there's like a local driver waiting for them? Oh, yeah, that's a good idea. Or if you, the idea of the local, like what if they get there and there's like, there's three cab drivers. Which one do you want? And like you could right. literally have like whichever one you're getting, you're probably actually going to be committing to for the rest of the scenario. And it, it could really change the flavor <laughs> depending on which of these three cab drivers you get. Or they don't get any. But you know, like kind of a local guy that's like, oh yeah, yeah. You know, I can, I know a guy that knows a guy. You know, my my my, my cousin's nephew's brother's got this. He's got a thing. He can hook you up with these people. No, that's a good idea. You, you, but if you have it where like the, the agents, like they, they've already got a hotel, they land and go. Yeah, in a con game, you want to take away some of those more mundane uh, choices, eliminate that headache and worry and and don't give the pcs a uh a reason to to delay they should be able to just go right in well it's like uh most of the old like D &D tournament scenarios started with you standing at the entrance of the dungeon sure like like, it was like here's a little late you're here to you know uh, to find the slavers of whatever it stole your brothers and you know blah 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 and after weeks of on the road, you are standing outside the dungeon and go. You do not get to negotiate the pay. You do not get to do. <laughs> no. Nope. Or- so here's here's the list that I've come up with, and I think I think this is a pretty good list. When we can work with these, because I, I a lot of this I pulled as you were talking about the uh, the history of uh, of what it was like to be filming in the Philippines. So we've got Chloe's agent. We have the actual film director. That's you know still there out there to be uh, interfaced with the producer, the town mayor, like I said, and also I love Chloe's agent, who I don't have a name for yet, but his contact in the Philippines. That'll be the the one that is going to receive the uh, PCs. That'll be their local contact that can kind of get them around and tip them off in what certain directions to go. This guy has already set up the uh, uh, hotels, you know, stuff and can arrange to have their baggage taken and you all have that it where he doesn't leave the city. So when they go to, yeah, their the, stuff will be protected. Yeah. Like, so when they go to the remote filming sites or, or wherever else we want to go, he stays there yeah. or it'll take some convincing to get him to leave. So that way they don't always have the friendly NPC that can give him help throughout this scenario. Or translate, right? I mean, he'll assure them, oh, everybody speak English. You know, I mean, so he'll just kind of, everybody's good when everybody's not good. But but he actually is on their side and he'll be a trustworthy source. But he'll stay behind and kind of guard their stuff. Uh, but he also can make all those arrangements for the mundane things that the PCs won't have to. Then we'll also have, because I loved how you said, you know, these film crews had to hire local talent so there will be a filipino film editor that they could meet there'll be a filipino cameraman that they could meet and i love the idea of a world war ii war vet an american expat who's still living there and that guy could be met too he might be the drunk who sees monsters in the dark 
uh, and has stories to tell. But you know, well, your mileage may vary may vary on how uh, reliable he is. I, well, so one of the the monsters that we we uh, rolled up was uh, Vormus, which also just by sheer chance happened to be related to to Sagawa, and we were like, okay. So there is a uh, okay. There's a, like a million cryptids in the Philippines. Uh, so I, I just kind of did like kind of some cursory searching. So there probably is a better one out there. But and now it's now it's my turn to uh, to totally butcher uh, the word. But uh, there was one that's called a mamongo, a mamongo that is the uh, the hairy white ape. And it's like their uh, their version of a Yeti. And I couldn't find any information of sightings of it prior to 2008. So I don't know if there was just some big incident of sightings or something in 2008 and it was older than that or if it didn't exist till 2008. But that, that kind of fits the description. And, uh, you know, the, the, the Vormies are brown, but we could we could have a, we could have a pale one. That's no big deal. We could have it where that that World War II vet, he could even talk about me and the boys, you know, back in the day. Uh, like he was either a POW or he was part of a ranger squad that, that went in and he was the only one that came out and with stories. And and that, like, and, and you could even have it where they have met him, they have interacted with him, and then... When this monster is mentioned, he's the guy, this unreliable drunk who can then kind of relate this story of this thing. And like, Mm -hmm. they came out of a cave. Well, where was the cave? I'll never forget where that cave was. (laughs) You know, so. Exactly. So I think. I I love it. I love this. And um, so that's a pretty big list. Uh, of NPCs. Plus, we'll probably figure out a couple more along the way. Uh, yeah, that yeah. We, and we I want to do. And I, I think it'll be okay because I, I think a lot of these are going to be characters that they are just meeting for information and not going to foil against. You know, so I don't know if full stats are going to be required on these guys, but you know, they need to be able to talk to somebody in almost every scene and or location. No, and, 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 and agree. And you could have it where the stuff like the, uh, the, the, the locals, the, the film expert, you know, the film crew that's ex- experienced, you know, there, there, there might not be enough use for to put them in like the full, like official dramatis personae, the adventure. But when you like, get to that section, it's like, okay, you know, here's so-and-so, here's a little bit about them. This is the information you can get from, and where it's like a little snippet, and then you know, like physical description, little trait, what he does, what he knows, and you know, boom, 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 boom. And if you did something like that, you could easily put in a, a couple more. You know, random stunt man, uh, uh, another one of the actors or actresses that came from the states, or one of the uh-huh. actors and actresses that's local. You know, you can just say like they're at the film filming site B, filming the new movie that's being made, and they're never they're probably never going to leave this spot. Uh, so it's not like they're just always at filming site B, yeah, you know, until the time time limit runs out, and then it doesn't matter. So we we could throw them a lot in without having to require the dramatic persona because clearly. Our, our foils are going to have to have full stats and all sorts of information about them. Yes. Well, and they, you know, came with full stats from those cards. So that's good. But yeah, we'll, uh, we'll have other people or creatures that they can, you know, butt up against. Cause I was thinking as, you know, we're still putting this together. There may, there may have been an ongoing, mythos issue some sort of problem in or around this remote town and it just so happens that the latest victim or possible victim to this issue was chloe and so now it's drawing outside attention you know 
and and so maybe you know maybe other uh locals have gone missing right oh and film crew your your mayor never cared about it your corrupt mayor doesn't want this getting out because absolutely he's he's got a, a pretty good hustle going on and and like a lot of locals are being employed and like you know, they're bringing in all this, this other money and, and all this. So like, he's going to try to squash that. And, you know, with going over the a lot of stuff with the Philippines, you know, life is cheap. Accidents happen. You know, he might even have a couple goons that he could send out if, if they're doing stuff to like rough them up or maybe just sabotage them. Um, because he doesn't want Chloe to be found dead. Or maybe it was his people that were like, oh yeah, she, 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 she met somebody and they they fell in love and eloped or, or something or, or you know, helped support this story that she left safe and sound because he's got a lot riding on this. So, but he, part of the investigation would be discovering that those reports were falsified and that this guy is an antagonist, but not the antagonist, right. He's an enabler. And oh, I really like that. I'm worried though, like, we well, can't make it too complicated for a con game. You know, con mm-hmm. games usually have to be pretty pretty simple. Fairly straightforward. So we should probably make it where that is pretty easy to uncover, providing our two idiots haven't gone and destroyed that evidence already. You know, so the uh, the one element that might be a little bit of a curveball, but I think we might be able to work it in, is the uh, f- thinking about the monsters. You know, so we have the Vormis, and we also have the Formless Spawn, which is also, you know, kind of in that Sathagwa circle, right? But then we drew the courtiers of the King in Yellow, which seems really left field, but... I'm wondering if, you know, the formless spawn, I need to look them up, but they, because uh, I'm wondering how intelligent they are. I'm wondering if there's, if there could be some kind of like conversion going on and that the formless spawn, instead of just simply feeding on these people that are going missing, if maybe a percentage of, of the ones that are going missing come back but there's something wrong with them and it's something that's hard for people i'm almost thinking like invasion of the body snatchers how you know the now human aliens in invasion of the body snatchers there's just that something is off with them but it's kind of hard to pinpoint until they become more numerous right and then then they stop hiding but maybe people get converted and come back and now they are the courtiers of the yellow king in yellow and and there's just something that they're doing that's gonna kind of start bringing this about and it doesn't have to make sense to humans but maybe there is some kind of temporary alliance of some sort between sathagwa and his minions and and the haster and the, the yellow king's minions okay so i i had a couple ideas here and uh so first I also was going with the um, some sort of corruption uh, where they do that. So let's say if we decide to do like you know, in the last day on set, there was a little earthquake. Maybe the back of the cave opened up, the front collapsed. Chloe was trapped in there for like a day before they could get it open. And when she came out, it wasn't Chloe anymore. So at one point we had discussed the idea of, of doing the serpent people and uh, maybe instead of like the consume lightness, where like they eat the person and they look like them. Like, what if we turn them into like a soup? And like eight serpent people ate them because it's a variant of the spell. Instead of that, we could have it to be where like, what if the formless spawn put a little piece of itself inside of her because it needed her to uh, to go to whatever the big city was, wherever they're doing the big hotel and the rap party or whatever it was steal something or get something then bring it back and that's where you could have like there was a robbery or an incident there was sightings of her actually going back to the film site after they had already been breaking it down to to move to the, the second film site location for the next movie and that's when she went into the, the cave again with whatever 
it was she god right like what if one of the props in the movies is actually like a local artifact and it's been in like four films right you know it's like you know something like the locals i was like oh yeah get, get that headdress that we used in like you know and 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 blood slavers six and uh we'll we'll spray paint it green this time but it's like this <laughs> valuable artifact that the um that the formless spawn is supposed to have protected it's like oh i finally got a way to get in this thing and um but because uh, uh, i like the idea and and i think did something like this in the two-headed serpent where you could like give yourself to the sagawa and then you turn into a formless spawn what if it put a little piece of itself in there. Like this is how they breed. And then, you know, like when, when, when it's ready, like as they get kind of more and more alien and weird, then finally they just kind of like split open and it's just, they're a formal spawn. Yeah. And that was like the birthing of it. And it's a small one. That way the characters have a better chance of actually taking one out because formless spawn, I can never stress enough are, they're awful. They they are so tough. But didn't didn't we determine that fire works on them when that? Oh, I believe so. Yeah. Okay. So the other thing they talked about in this documentary was the pyrotechnics and how ridiculously unsafe it was. And <laughs> like, you know, I I mentioned like you know like the 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 army and all this stuff like that. That could be a cool way of dealing with it is like there's literally boxes of explosives that are in a grass hut (laughs) that are like the the demolition team stuff or like, you know, it's it's safely secured in a in a canvas covered truck defeatable by any small blade. And, you know, and now we have got uh, explosives that are probably remnants of like, you know, explosives from the second world war or we could even pull in actual stuff from the second world war if we want to pull in like an old bunker like the japanese when they were digging into the philippines they dug too deep and that's how the American I, guy yeah. got there man i'm throwing I'm out ideas idea. like crazy <laughs> i'm oh. loving this i'm loving this i think this is something we can totally work with okay all right i know I, I, i'm like watching the the the, the, the share if you're like typing these really quickly, if I like, Seth, slow down <laughs> now, but my no, other I, idea, I think we're getting a lot of good ideas here is what if the courtiers and the King in yellow has something to do with the second movie being hmm. that that's where you kind of throw in the meta gaming foil. Like if the players show up and they're like, Oh, they're doing a movie and it says something about the yellow King. Oh, that's what it's about. It's like, no, it's not about that at all because in this world, the, the Yellow King was a play, and the Grindhouse Cinema would definitely jump on something like that. So absolutely, they're doing the the paper mache monster monster movie, the Courtiers of the King in Yellow, full of the like, you know what was it? I've written down, you know, blood breasts and beasts. You know, some sexploitation horror movie, the Courtiers of the King in Yellow. And that's being filmed. And and that's a great film title. <laughs> you know? Like, yeah. You know, yeah, the, the the poster, like, you know, they're wearing like the hooded cloaks and a mask and like a little loincloth, you know. And you've got your 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 evil women sacrificing somebody and like you know, that's your your poster. The letters of the title, you know, cover the breasts. And man, man, we're gonna have to hire like a really good artist for this. Like, can you do the most <laughs> Could barely squeeze it past censors, nineteen seventies. I think uh, John Sumrow's up for this challenge. I'm not going to volunteer Sumrow for it, but John, if you're listening, I would appreciate it. Well, because I think I would love it if the cover looked like the um, you know, Blood Rain, like the movie poster, starring yep. you know Chloe yep. Kirsch, Kirschner, and you know like. I think that'd be great. Like the NPC names are literally on the title, like directed by, produced by. <laughs> yep. Yeah, that would be awesome. That would be awesome. I like this. This is a good idea. Then the back cover is the courtiers of the King in Yellow coming soon. All right. Well, I think this is a lot for us to chew on and to uh, to work on. So, so you know. So, kind of in summary, this, I think 
yeah, I think we have a lot that we can actually start working with and start kind of moving forward. So in the future, as we have episodes like this, it'll be, we'll be able to like give a summary on what we've accomplished and then what we want to work on next. Well, what, one thing though that I think we should look into next is exactly what the bad guy is, like the villain yep. and their motivation. And I think once we have that, we'll be able to cement. Uh, I think we said five locations is what we kind of were, were looking at doing. But until we know exactly who the bad guy is and what it is they're doing and, and why, will we know what the fifth and possibly the fourth location are? Because that would be the the rescue and, and confrontation sort of thing. So I think that's, but we'll, we'll probably have to figure that one out just between us, between episodes. And then the next time say, we yep. have decided yeah. that yep, we're going to do aged Hollywood actors and <laughs> we're going to Peter Lorre <laughs> we're doing that instead. That will work. So I'm awesome. going to have to make like four bogus patrons account to like throw the vote off. <laughs> You go right ahead. Okay. You know, I, I, I really like this. Uh, this this is fun. Um, I, the only part that makes me sad is we throw out so many good ideas that there's no way we're going to be able to use every one of them. Right. Yeah, but, I mean, that's the great thing about ideas is you, you put them out there, you use what you can, you shelve the rest, and pull them down on the next one, you know? Now, um, uh, a couple things, which y- you and I have discussed, but... There was, at one point, we discussed the possibility of a pulp. Do we do it Cthulhu? Do we do it pulp? Or do we do it a way a lot of the newer scenarios have been doing, where they're like, it can be run with both, and we're going to give you conversion stuff. Like, this is the bad guys, if they're pulp, stats. This is normal. You know, if you are doing Call of Cthulhu, the mayor sends three goons to deal with the bad guys. If we're doing pulp, the mayor sends 15 goons to deal with the, yeah. the, the um, I got to tell you, because I would really like to kind of tap in and, and try to emulate some of that. Not maybe not emulates the wrong word. I, I want to try and capture the essence and the feel of what it would be like to be uh, making one of these uh, supposedly making one of these uh, exploitation films and maybe even have, you know, scenes that are, you know, uh, eerily reminiscent and, and, you know, real for the setting uh, real of the, of those types of films. I think we should just make this as pulp instead of, you know, walking the line and saying it could be done both ways. Let's just, I say go for it and do pulp. Pulp exploitation. Pulp exploitation. Oh my god. Oh, so all of them are gonna know kung fu. Absolutely. And there'll be a psychic. And oh. there could be weird science. Oh. Oh, I love this. I, I, I think I, this could be really cool. Oh my god, I love this all of a sudden. <laughs> I think I think even weird science that the monsters might be using could be, you know, like courtiers of the king and you look under their hairline and there's an antenna coming out of their skull oh my god okay yeah sold <laughs> okay uh so we're we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna pulp exploitate this oh my god uh, we're, we're gonna when we do npcs it's like so who are they it's like almost pam greer <laughs> right <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Oh, oh. Oh my god. So instead of my aged Hollywood actors, I've just got the the serial numbers filed off of like, you know, Sid Haig and Pam Greer and Arlie Emery are going to save the day. There you go. There you go. Exactly. In fact, yeah, this <laughs> like, this I'm, World I'm so War II, this, this World War II war vet American expat is, you know, Arlie Ermy with the uh, uh serial numbers filed off <gasps> for sure. Oh my god. Because I was, I, I was originally thinking of uh, if you saw the new Kong movie when uh, then they come across the World War II veteran. It's just amazing. Oh, I right. The, yeah, I, yeah, I, can, yeah. I can see his face. I've seen him in a million things. Yeah, he's the like in Step Brothers with... Yeah. Uh, yeah, he's one of those comedian... Yeah, what is his name? Oh, well. 
Yeah, but then Anyways, he, he did, like, he's good. Stan and Ollie, which yeah, you know, that the trailer for that like made me too sad to watch it. Um, if you ever, I do want to see that. I, I have not so seen bad. it. Yet. I was like going to show it to my wife one night. I was like, "Hey, we should watch this." She's like, "Let me see the trailer." And they were kind of sitting there, kind of solemn. I was like, "I don't, I don't think we're in the mood for for this. This <laughs> looks, this looks like we're going to cry." <laughs> I grew up loving Lauren Hardy. Uh, shorts and movies love them okay and uh, one of the things i'd like to do is see if we can open it with a one maybe one and a half page kind of like history of cinema in the philippines sort of like crash course for keepers maybe with yeah. like maybe check out these movies which means you and i are about to have to like watch check out some awesome movies watch uh uh the the the, the you, you found the list of all the movies that are referenced in that documentary uh yeah. like just like let's go through these <laughs> <laughs> I want the, over one i want to watch the cobra mo- cobra woman w- movie for sure 72 hours you and i will just sit there watching these movies like virtually online losing, no losing real sanity oh my god that'd be wonderful <laughs> but that's awesome i i think we got enough here that we can work with something we can make something out of this I agree. I agree. And the the the, the pulp exploitation has absolutely got me excited. Well, we want to thank our patrons, especially for this episode and and the uh, the support that they're giving us uh, in the creation of this scenario and the support for this show. We have a lot of patrons to thank uh, for supporting this show and making this episode possible and supporting us as we try and write this episode and, and for their support in just getting this show on the air. And we have a lot of new patrons to thank. Uh, we want to thank Joe Todaro. Thank you for your support. Thank you, Joe. And uh, also a thank you to Scott Core. Thank you, Scott. Uh, thanks to Chris Ariayu. Ariayu. I apologize. I am positive. I am uh, butchering your last name, but I'm, thank I'm, you, Chris. I thank you very much, Chris. And I, I intentionally made sure John got that one to read. So, <laughs> <laughs> And also a thank you to James W. Thank you, James. Thank you. I really appreciate your support. And... A thank you to Matthew Rep. Thank you, Matthew. And this was John's Revenge. Uh, Ruther X. There are no vowels. Ruther X. My my assumption is that is an online handle and not their birth name. I don't think a mother did that to him. I don't know. You don't know. <laughs> you don't know. You're right. But thank you. Amigo thank you, human. Ruther X. Uh, we want to also thank uh, Jim Calabrese. Thank you, Jim. You. I'm pretty sure that's how you pronounce that. And finally, Darren Chandler. Thank you. Thank you, Darren. We really appreciate it. Speaking of our patrons, Seth, even going back all the way to episode one of this show, I have talked about dangled like a mouse on the end of a string in front of a cat, the thought of running the uh the code for you are are we doing this i am making this promise now that i will run the code for you online on sunday september the 18th but obviously we need a few more players don't you think well it'd be good it'd be good It, uh... it would be good So I'm putting this out now for our patrons. Our patrons at the $10 level or higher, you will all be put into a randomization drawing, and I will be drawing three names to join Seth and play at the virtual table. We will play the code. Uh, And so this this is open for any... Uh, patron of the uh, $10 level or higher and uh, if you want to play the code with Seth join now get your name into the mix and I will draw 500% chance John will kill me in this this game (laughs) (laughs) that seems that seems kind of low I I know nothing about the code other than I'm going to die even if it's like 
this is the one Call of Cthulhu scenario you're always going to live through. And John's going to be like, you're dead. <laughs> so how, how many are we doing for this? I'll draw three additional names. Then that way there'll be a grand total of four players. Yourself and three uh, patrons. I will run the game. And I will do the drawing the week before the game. So on Sunday, the 11th of September... I'll do the drawing and find, and I will contact those players on that day as well. So it'll be a one week advance. So if you're interested and want to play, or at least have an opportunity to play the code with you, Seth, then join our Patreon at the ten dollar level or higher. I will collect those names, all of the names that are at that level, and. Uh, pull the names and the plan is we're gonna this will be a one shot and we're gonna play for you know let's plan for six hours right so we'll play for six hours on uh sunday the 18th that should be plenty of time to uh to do this to to get the scenario fully played and so yeah um, okay. I'll do the drawing a week before, and anybody who I contact, if the 18th won't work for you, we'll just I'll have to go on and, and pick a different player. But that's what we'll do. So if you're interested and want an opportunity to play, join. Please check okay. out the link in our show notes and become a patron. Good, and and, and they can be witnesses to the fact John's going to murder me <laughs> in this adventure, and they can come back and be all like, "Yeah, he totally, totally." Like, it would be it would be highly entertaining murder for sure. Oh man, I I don't know how I'll feel once the code is done. Like what 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 are you taunt me with? But <laughs> <laughs> the fact your adventure got voted for. Okay, so I guess that. Oh, there's that. Oh, there's that. oh, I, and the next one you're going to be wearing a shirt that's like I won. <laughs> I need to write that down. Okay. <laughs> also, we do have a Discord where uh, we uh, several people have actually made a few suggestions and, and bounced some ideas for this adventure. So if any listeners out there do have any suggestions or ideas, maybe a little bit of knowledge about the subject material that uh, we think would work well in there, please join our Discord and uh, and, and let us know. Also, any any questions, show ideas, chat us up, whatever else. Uh, we have a link down in the show notes uh, to our uh, Discord invite. Drop by. Say hi. Please do. I try and pop through it um, at least once a day. So I am I am so notoriously bad on Discord. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I love it. I'm I'm always, you know, kind of going through and checking things out. And also you can thank Seth and his uh, his YouTube magic as uh, this podcast is also available on YouTube. Sort of pseudo as a video, more of a slideshow, but still very cool. And and not and not as prompt. I think the last few have been like really late. Uh, so ah, well. hopefully, hopefully I can speed this one up along. But yeah, what are you gonna do? Well, I'm I yeah you know, I, I had Gen Con and all this stuff going on, and it was like. I'll get to that tomorrow, he says for two weeks straight. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and then I'll start my diet. Exactly. But yeah, we got a link to the, the YouTube if you want to yeah, kind of watch a slideshow of. Yeah, uh, it will usually show pictures of whatever it is I'm talking about. So a lot of and pictures. Cthulhu will wink every now and then. Every once in a while. Something I've actually got where his eyes will glow different colors. Um, I did one where he like spun around and shot around on the screen. I, I was trying to get that uh, <laughs> the old like DVD uh, screensaver thing going. And, right. Yeah, I didn't have the technical ability to do it, so I just kind of like had to just go crazy for a few seconds. <laughs> That's funny. We also have a link to our uh, Facebook page. I will admit I am pretty bad about updating and doing Facebook, but I I will try and get better at it. But uh, we do have a Facebook presence out there. Please come check us out. I always get a notification, so uh, I will do better at uh, getting on Facebook and saying hi. And we also have a Redbubble store. Where you can pick up a Modern Mythos shirt or stickers or different swag like that. So yeah, and you know, and our store it seems weird because when you land on the page, I guess it looks like there's only a sticker, but in the left hand side there's a menu. 
just click on t-shirts or mugs or whatever it is that you want from the left side menu and it will pull up exactly what's available because it's all available they, they so, might yeah. have they might have done an update because i remember when you first showed me the store i saw all the stuff and then I know. the last time i went there it was just the stickers so it was like i wonder what happened and i thought it was something where like they took it down but evidently i think they might have changed their interface or, or something but they probably did uh but yeah. yeah i remember the first time i saw everything and the second time was the stickers and i was like oh my god what went wrong but uh so by the, by the time this airs they'll probably have changed it again who knows probably we also have a a cool artifacts a, a call of cthulhu book of artifacts on drive through rpg that you can uh that you can download, purchase and download. And all of the artifacts in that book were inspired by patrons. So they're all named after different patrons. So yeah. it's kind of cool. And we'll, we'll think of something interesting in the future to do with our patrons again. But this was a neat way to uh, immortalize some of the some of the folks there. It was like, you know, their names are names that they chose, which we are going to need a lot of names for this scenario. So who knows? Yes, especially this list of NPCs we just put together. I think I might take that to the Discord and have people go at it and start naming a, these guys. Patron that's like, would you like a smarmy producer named after you? <laughs> exactly. Oh, that's awesome. We cannot do this show alone. We want to thank our amazing editors, Max Mahaffa and Edwin Nagy, for their hard work and keen skills at making us sound awesome. Thank, thank you, guys. guys. Especially this one, because... I have no idea why I keep I keep messing up. <laughs> Listeners will never know. Exactly. Uh, they we, they take out more of my ums than anything else, I think. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Ums. That's that's all you do. Uh versus me, who like keeps like, wait, wait, hold on, what's what are we doing? But we also want to thank John Sumro for our badass logo that I badly tried to animate spinning around on a YouTube video and you don't need to see that, John. You don't, you don't, you see what I did with it. But he is a very talented artist, so please follow him on Facebook and check out his official website. And please also consider joining his Patreon account, of course, in the show notes. And finally, we want to thank the Darkest of the Hillside Thickets for generously allowing us to use, to use their song Gluttony as our intro and outro music. Honestly, if you are a fan of the Lovecraft's writing and the uh, Call of Cthulhu role-playing game, then please go check out this band, The Darkest of the Hillside Thickets. Check out their band camp site, check out their official band site, and we have links to both of those in the show notes. Thank you for listening. Thank you.